is working, working. Yay, computer, thank you. All right, here we are in our chilly setting. <laughs> I know, people around the country are uh, very jealous of Florida right now. But that's okay, because we can all share the warmth of the Mishnah. Uh, hopefully when you came in, you picked up our packet, which has the last two Mishnayot of chapter two, and then has chapter three in it. Uh, when you came in as well, um, hopefully you also noticed the flyers for the Melton programs. Uh, these are community programs that are being run through the Federation, but Melton is nationally known. Uh, Nathan can tell you it's a very top rate uh, organization, very good education. Uh, they're doing another taste of Melton. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the, the one on the right. Uh, uh, there was one on Monday, but they're doing another one uh, December 2nd in this area. They're doing another one down south uh, sooner than that. Uh, and then they're doing a, uh, a section uh, that's entirely on, oh, someone could get that. And they're doing another section entirely on the, uh, the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, that's going to be a nine-week course. And that begins, I think, in January. Uh, that's what the other flyer is that's titled Beyond Borders. Uh, so hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more about Melton. Uh, once we get all the information from them, we'll be sending out the, the emails. Uh, but I had some flyers that I got from uh, Yael Weinstein, who's the director of Melton here. And uh, I thought I'd pass them on to the people who seem most interested in, in Jewish education. So uh, Melton really does some, some very good programs. We have a education program, December 50, with uh, our Jewish community and Jewish community and the diversity and the, the, the divisions in the society in Israel and U.S. Sectarian is, oh, I mean divisions between Israel and U.S. or divisions within Israel and U.S.? Both. Both. That's a big topic. <laughs> All right. Make sure that everyone gets a copy there of, it'll say chapter 2, Mishnah 13 on the top. I think I made enough copies for everyone. All right, looks like we got our full crew tonight. No one took the night off. Uh, that means we'll have lots of readers. And maybe we won't even come back to the same person. Maybe it's only just one reader uh, per Mishnah, uh, or one Mishnah per reader, rather. All right, so uh, as promised, uh, for whatever reason, it didn't print out. Uh, so we had to miss Mishnah 13 and 14 last week uh, from the end of chapter two. This week, we've got them. Uh, it's going to sound very familiar. We're talking about trees, whereas last week, we talked about trees underground. This week, we're talking about the trees over, right, the, the limbs. We good? All right. Richard, would you mind starting us off? Uh, Mishnah 13. Right there. Okay. Right there. On the beginning, even. <laughs> well, uh, okay. So, if the tree stretches, stretches into another field, he may cut it away as far as it is reached by an ox coat, ox coat held over the plow. Or if it's a carob or sycamore. They cut it away according to the plumb line. All right, so we've got our tree, and we've got, um, you know, this is Mr. A's property. This is Mr. B's property. And the problem is the branches come into Mr. B's property. Everyone got the problem here? Or at least maybe what is the problem here? So if it's a regular tree, then if I've got my, my ox, right, that's down here plowing, I need to be able to have my free hand over the top of the ox to keep saying move along ox and to hit the ox to keep it to move right a very practical concern if the branches are too low and my my stick is hitting the branches then i can't make my ox work or at least not easily and that's not fair right it's my property i should be able to 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 move my ox the way i need to and so you would be allowed to cut it so that it doesn't cause a problem with the ox goat Make sense? Okay, if it is this carob or sycamore, which we talked about, are these very wide, very heavy branches, really kind of annoying when it comes to branches, if you're the neighbor, then you can do a plumb line. Uh, a plumb line is, you know, you take something that's heavy, you attach a string, you let it drop straight down, and you get a straight line because gravity, yes. So you take your string and you go whoop, and then you just cut everything over there. Right? And you end up with a very funny looking tree. But you know what? This is my property. These trees are invasive, we would basically call them in the modern world. And therefore, I can cut the entire thing off because I don't want to deal with your sycamore 
and, and your carob tree. These are not good for, for my property. Make sense? Wait, how do you get to cut the whole thing off again? With a plumb line. A right, plumb line means straight at the property line. Oh, I, I think you can go as uh, high enough. No, no? Plumb, line, plumb line means get the chainsaw out. Right. When it says for the first part of that, right, if it's uh, as far as is reached by an ox goad, that's where you sort of hollow out the tree, um, raise the, the, the canopy so that I have free access underneath it. But the plumb line is cutting it at the uh, at the borderline. But that's only for uh, certain type of only for certain types of trees, which are considered oh, to be uh, a nuisance. Yeah. Oh, exactly. The carob or sycamore. The carob or sycamore. Exactly. The carob or sycamore. Make sense? Okay, so. So all trees that stretch over irrigated fields may be cut away according to the plumb lines measure. All right, so if you have an irrigated field, then these are even more, more sensitive, right, to, to the various things that can happen um, from the trees, from the shade, from the droppings, and all of that. And so whoop, I can mow that tree straight uh, along my property line so it doesn't bother my, my field. Make sense? Okay, Abba Shaul has his own opinion. Abba Shaul says, all trees that bear no fruit may be cut away according to the plumb line measure. Right, so Abba Shaul says, actually, you know, as long as it's not a fruit tree and therefore you're not really damaging it, you can cut any old tree uh, right along the plumb line. He loses that argument. Um, now, what's the problem with, with his position? Well, the Mishnah is trying to find a compromise between the rights of property owner B and the rights of property owner A. Right, cutting the tree back when it's not harming anything seems unnecessarily harsh. Um, and therefore, the, the what we call the Tanakama, the first opinion, says, no, no, no. Just make sure there's enough room that you can use the space under the tree. Unless it's a nuisance tree, and then, yes, cut the whole thing as you need. Abba Shaul says, no, no, no. It's my property. I can cut whatever I feel like as long as it's not harming him. And in this particular case, he loses. The, the basic principle is, do I have to worry about harming A, harming A's tree, or do I have to worry about harming B's field? And there's a compromise here, which is I will um, harm A's tree only so much as I need for B's field. I'm not going to say B can do it just because he wants to. Uh, he, he can only do it when there's actually a problem. Do we know that there is some strong relationship between the opinion and the profession of the robots? Uh, in this topic, I don't know. Um, in, in a few other places, they will they will defer to a rabbi who's known to have a specialty of a particular. No, I mean that, for example, let's say that they profession influence the opinion. You mean because some some rabbis were farmers, some rabbis yeah. were, were merchants. And, so that's why they are more lenient or not more restrict depending on their personal experience. So I said, in, in certain places, they will defer. They'll say, well, this person knows sheep. Or, you know, this person, uh, well, the most famous example is a bad one where Rabbi Yochanan says that Reish Lakish knows weapons. Um, but that, that's yeah. not a happy story. No. Um, <laughs> Well, and, and that's the general thing, which is that the argument has to be an argument, not just your personal opinion. And so the, the, the sages may have come from different professions, but in the end, the argument has to stand on its own merit, on its own validity. I think what you're saying, like if you're a spoon maker, you might say, oh, making spoons doesn't disturb the neighbors. Uh, exactly, thank you. That's, that, that's exactly right. But, but you may have that opinion. Yeah. But the other rabbis aren't all spoon makers. And if you're like, a, if you run an inn, you might say, "Oh, those spoons definitely disturb my guests." <laughs> and that's why the rabbis don't make a decision just based on what would bother them, except for they do tend to give an awful lot of respect to rabbis. So the the one place where there is unanimity and where you do see a shared opinion is when it comes time to, to defend Torah, when it comes time to defend study, when it comes time to defend rabbis, then yes, on, on a similar boat. But even there, they don't give carte blanche. They don't just say, oh, all rabbis are perfect and can't do any wrong. Like I said in last week's sermon, you know, there are ways of getting rid of bad rabbis. And the rabbis are the people who invented the rules of how to get rid of bad rabbis. Um, it wasn't like they, you know, had, like they thought all rabbis were perfect. They, they knew too many rabbis. They knew not all rabbis were perfect. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, there may have been some influence, but 
uh, partly also because there was such diversity of profession. Um, it meant that they all had very different perspectives to bring. Uh, in fact, in, in Israel, oh, 10 years ago now, there was a great ad for the Masor for the conservative movement. They they put out a, an ad in the papers uh, that looked like a, uh, like a page from the yellow pages of different you know, professions. And it was the names of all the rabbis from the Mishnah and the Talmud and the later sages as well with the job they did. And it was trying to say, you know, that yeah. rabbis are supposed to be part of the community. They're supposed to, yeah, it was really good. It was really, <sighs> I haven't seen one um, recently, but uh, I can see if I can dig one up, but yeah. It would be Jerusalem that would have it because they ran it in Israel. Because that could be very interesting yeah. for us to have in, in one uh, source or the rabbi with different professions. We it, can't it, see the, the relations between yeah. them. But it's in Hebrew, though, right? Uh, I know they did do an English translation of it. Um, the original was in Hebrew, but I know they did a translation. Because some of the professions I didn't know off the top of my head. Because <laughs> a lot of the professions they had were pretty weird. Um, okay, so that's Mishnah 13. Mishnah 14. Also on trees, but this time public domain trees, right? Trees that are out, that are leaning not into Mr. B's property, but into public property. Okay, so the tree is on the private property, but if the branches go into public property. Aaron? If a tree stretches into the public domain enough, must be cut away to allow a camel and its rider pass by. All right, so now let's get my tree bigger again. All right, I've got my tree that's coming out, and this time it's a camel. That's a hump. Um, <laughs> I need to make sure the tree is high enough, high enough that the camel plus a guy can sit on the back of the camel and walk, right? It's basically the equivalent of you have to keep the roads clear. Uh, your tree cannot block the, the road. Um, and if that damages your tree, I'm sorry, but you don't get to use this public space in a way that will damage the rest of us being able to use this public space. Questions? Florida, they have <laughs> I, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but yeah, I was going to bring up that this tree legislation may sound really familiar because if you look at a lot of the trees in Florida, they, they've been shaped to make it so that a truck can pass under uh, or that the wires don't get hurt by the branches, right? right? The electric or phone wires and all of that, that these trees, like if you look at the trees out in front of the shul, they're all weird going around where the wires are. What's that? I, I never pay attention to it. You never noticed the uh, <laughs> coming from California. First of all, we don't have that many trees in San Diego when I was growing up, and the ones we had were just little palm trees or eucalyptus. Um, it was absolutely amazing to me when I got here, and I see all these trees in these weird shapes, yeah, and yeah. also these huge canopies, like like tunnels of trees that go over roads, and the fact that the people have to drive around and cut them all the time to keep the tree from taking over the road. So uh, yeah, we, we still use this kind of idea with a different standard. You know, there are no camels going around these days, um, but the basic principle remains is that you can't let your tree take away from the use of the public domain um, at, at other people's expense. Uh, your tree, even if it means getting damaged, is gonna have to be cut back in order to make sure that the public use can still be uh, fair. Make sense? Okay, onward. Uh, Rabbi Judah says a camel laden with flax or bundles of branches. Okay, so that's a lower measure, right? So he's saying, you know, you know, you don't really need to say that it has to be enough for a camel plus a rider, which is, you know, another three feet sitting on top of the camel. A camel plus its load, you know, maybe a foot, a foot and a half of that's extra stuff. Uh, stop. That that's that's the minimum that we need to cut at clearance because. Lower than a man. It's lower than a man, right? So Rabbi That's Yehuda, it, well, why? Because the people that the working people, I do walk, you want to be sure that it's clean and not, you don't want to start like walking. True. Before. But what is the more usual case? That there's somebody actually riding the camel through the street or there's somebody using the camel for work? And where does your right to ride tall in the camel saddle end and my right to have a healthy tree begin? I mean that also if you are and human standing is higher than the camel. No, 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 no. No, no. You, 
You were in Israel with us on camels. You saw how tall they were. I don't think they're talking about baby camels here, right? So an average camel at the hump is going to be taller than an average person, especially in the ancient world. Uh, you know, the average person in the ancient world was definitely shorter than the average person nowadays. Um, so, and then you put a pack on top of the camel, it's still higher still. So they're talking about seven, eight foot versus clearance. But a camel with a person on it is at least nine foot, you know, sort of uh, a height. At least that's that's my rough camel estimate. <laughs> uh, so Rabbi Yehuda is saying that it could be a little bit lower and we'd still be okay. Whereas Rabbi Shimon says, uh, every tree must be cut away according to the plumb line's measure because of impurity. Rabbi Shimon has a totally different issue that he wants to bring up. And his issue is, what happens if there is, well, let's, let's be, you know, nice and not say it's a dead body. Let's say there's a grave over here, right? And inside the grave, there's a dead body. So a that's... would do it too, right? What? Would a squirrel do it too? Not exactly. Uh, the different, different degrees of impurity. Uh, but let's use the, the, the maximum uh, degree of impurity, the ritual impurity that comes from the dead, right? So the grave is technically giving off impurity. And um, we didn't study a lot of it, but let me make the picture a little bit better. But we have covered a little bit in Idiot the idea that a tree is going to create what's called an ohel. It's going to create like a tent structure, which means the impurity here, I'll change colors one more time, is going to go up and it's going to come down everywhere beneath the tree would be ritually impure. And so Rabbi Yehuda is like, well, wait a minute. There could be a Kohen walking through this street. All right. So if there's a canopy and he doesn't know what's on the other side, then he could become ritually impure without even knowing it. So therefore, cut it, cut it, cut it straight. All right. Go back to our plumb line and make a straight cut. And that way we're safe. What do you think? Which opinion do you think wins in this? The first one. Uh, the first one. Okay. So the first opinion, which says camel with rider, that has that's the height we need to clear, but the tree can still be in the public domain as long as there's that much clearance for, for a person. The the idea of Rabbi Shimon, yes, there is a world a worry about this, perhaps, but we can't cut everything down just to prevent possible impurity. It, it, it's one of those cases where, you know, in came in of our self, you would never end. <laughs> well, but the coin doesn't know is the bigger question, yeah. right? That, 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 put the sign. <laughs> a warning, graveyard <laughs> on the other side of the tree. Yeah. And, be, be and, and to be honest, if you live in a small town, which most people did, you would know where the graves were. You would know where a cemetery was. It, it wasn't like people were just burying somebody in the backyard. That, that was very uh, uncommon in, in the ancient world. It's uncommon now, too. Does the first one win? Yes, the first one wins, right? So camel plus rider height clearance, but it does not need to be cut uh, at the uh, at the plumb line. And that's the end of chapter two. Good? Okay, because chapter three is a totally different topic. Dun, dun, dun. All right, I can erase my tree because they're not going to need this. In fact, I don't know that I'm going to need to draw anything for, for this section. This is much more a question of how do you know that somebody owns a piece of property? How do you know? How do you know nowadays? Uh, real estate agent. How do I know who owns a piece of property? If I knock on the door. So? All right. So the city has records. Yes. And you do a title search to find out who actually owns that piece of, of property. And then you can, you know, pull up the deed. You can pull up the, the property markers and know exactly where the so begins. And, have there are, uh, two or three witnesses because they like all everything three witnesses. Uh, so we like witnesses, but the problem is, is that you don't always have witnesses to to when things happen. Now, the best way to handle property purchases in Jewish law is the same way that we handle most purchases with the giving of money, with the giving of a contract, with the with the usage of witnesses and all of that. But sometimes we don't always get the perfect solution, right? Remember, the Mishnah is often covering the not perfect solution. Mm -hmm. um, so there is another way for someone to own a piece of property or to be said to be the legitimate owner of a piece of property. And that's called a chazaka, a presumption. They have to build up a presumption that this is indeed theirs. And the Mishnah is going to describe 
how you do that. Um, in, in modern American law, this is something akin to um, like squatter's law um, or, or, or common, I think they call it like common law property property ownership. Like if you've lived on a certain piece of land for a certain amount of time. Also in Israel, it's building a house. Uh, we're going to get to, fence. yeah, we're going to get to building and fencing later. That's actually later in chapter yeah, three. I, I thought that law was a Turkish law. Uh, it might be. No, not from here, because that's the law that the, the first pioneers right. in so, Israel, the Zionists in the second idea, they created right. the kibbutz. So when it comes to improving the land, we'll cover that in more detail later on in, in chapter three. Um, but that was also the law for many, many years in American law, um, when Americans would um, head out into the West and take land away from the Indians. Often the way they would prove that they owned the land was because they had built something on it or they had put a fence around it. Yeah. And that became very important. Now we'll come back to that later on in this, uh, in this chapter, uh, maybe tonight, we'll see. Um, but we're gonna start off with a, a more neutral case of how do we know somebody owns the land that they're sitting on? Make sense? Okay, and again, remember this is all special circumstances, if there is witness, if there is a contract, that supersedes this discussion. But if you don't have those things, this is how we solve the issue. I thought, oh. uh, I thought if they had a contract that still applies because you're making a claim that uh, the contract was three years earlier. Yes, yes and no, depending upon other circumstances. So it can, it can always get more complicated, <laughs> but we're gonna deal with sort of the most neutral version of this, right? rather, rather than extra layers. Abraham, this Kasha, I actually was thinking about it. But because when uh, he was talking with Ephron right. about the... About Machpelah, about the, the cave, the, uh, yeah. Machpelah, Ephron was willing to give it for free. And mm -hmm. Abraham said, no, I want to pay for it. And he did it in public. In public. Yes, yeah. and he did it with very clear markers of this is where the property oh, is. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And you know what? We still have the document. Yeah. It's called the Torah, <laughs> right? The Torah is a record of the land sale. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, Ephraim and the Hittites have not been uh, arguing about it, so I guess it's valid. <laughs> uh, no, no Hittites around to complain now. <laughs> so the legal period of possession in order to establish ownership for houses, sisters, trenches, caves, dope coats, bathhouses, old presses, irrigated fields, and slaves and anything which continuously produce the yield is a tree as it is three complete years. All right. So if I can show that I have been living on this land and working this land and using this land or using the other things for three years, then I am assumed to be the rightful owner. Anybody here surprised by that? Does it sound perfectly normal? I was expecting seven years. Seven years, like a sabbatical, right? Like like a sabbatical cycle. But with the sabbatical cycle, doesn't it go back to the original owner? Well, this would see, this would mean that I am the correct owner, right? So let's once, say, oh, sorry, let's say several years have gone by. Let's right. Say sixty years have gone by. <laughs> right. Okay. Now the son of the original owner mm -hmm. shows up. All right. So we're going to deal with 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 people who may have been out of the loop. In, in the next couple of Mishnayot. But let's deal with the, the regular situation of, you know, uh, I, I'm in the small town of Winter Springs and I take a piece of land and I build my house on it and I'm farming on it. Sorry, make sure that's not important. It isn't, and then turn the ringer off. Uh, and I build my, my house on it and I'm farming the land and everyone can see this for three years. And then in the fourth year, my neighbor says, oh, he doesn't own that, that's mine. The answer would be no. That doesn't, no, <laughs> it belongs to him, right? And what's the basic issue here? Where were you for the last three years? The guy's been living on the land. He's been using the land. Everybody knows he's on this land. And now after four years, you're going to start saying that he doesn't own it? Right? You had three years to protest, three years to register a complaint, three years to go to the court and say this is a problem. So no, if he's on the land and it's been, everybody knows this has gone on for three years and you had the chance to, to complain about it, you don't get to complain about it now. Interesting that they picked the three years because three years is the time that you are allowed to pick the, the, the first fruit from the trees. No, not the time you were allowed to, the time you the have three, to. No, to eat. No, you would, no the, 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 the three years you would let it rest. The fourth year you take it as the Bikurim to Jerusalem and you get to eat it there. Yes. The fifth year is when you get free use. 
right? But that fourth year, you have an obligation to take mm -hmm. it. So if you're not the, the rightful owner or someone's going to contest it, then now you're missing the mitzvah that you need to do. So it, is the reason why you do that? I don't know that that's the reason why, but it, it definitely so fits. Uh, you know, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Danny, Rabbi, yeah. Is this from uh, Rosh Hashanah? Does the year start? Uh, no, they're, they're actually talking about how long the person has been on the land. Like, it, so like it's date stamped from your arrival. Uh, not, not the, 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 not the, the, not the calendar year. Thank you. Uh, all right. Part two. The legal period of possession in order to establish ownership for a field irrigated by rain water is three years and they need not to be completed. Okay. So it can be three years, um, which is, we're going to see a, a particular way of trying to break that down in the next couple sections. But the idea being that, oh, sorry, uh, um, uh, one, uh, it, that it can be three years, but not necessarily uh, three full years. So in our first example, I do need to draw after all. Uh, we have year one, year two, year three, and the first example, it needs to be complete. In our second example, we need to have something that covers three years, but it doesn't have to be all of the three years. So the difference between the first category and the second category is, as I've said at the very end, about it being a continual yield. Right? This is something you're benefiting from the entire time. So there'd be no reason for you not to be using the land. Right? If you have a land that you can get two harvests out of, or that you can harvest one thing and then prepare it for something else and then another thing, then you would never not use the land. Because, you know... What are you, stupid? <laughs> You're going to keep using something if you can always get benefit from it. But if it's a piece of land that's only irrigated by the rain, then you're lucky if you get one harvest out of that each year because the, the rain is just going to come occasionally and that will be what you get. So you wouldn't expect to be working the land constantly because the land is not going to be producing constantly. Make sense? All right, so now Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva are going to argue okay. about how much of the three years we need to have. Yeah, he actually says why three years. Oh, does he? Yes. Yeah. yeah he What's says his explanation? Because, yeah, it, it, because if, let's say, somebody bought right. a field from somebody, and he has a document. Oh, no, no, no. That, that, but for three years, yeah. he might, might have kept it. But then after three years, he lost it. OK. So that's the three years. OK. I thought you were going to talk about the next section, which no, talks no. about a long distance person. So you were. I thought you were going to steal the mission of thunder. <laughs> was saying if you didn't protest, that's evidence, and I said well, yeah. I from you, the fact that you didn't protest would be the evidence that that you sold it to me. Well, so correct, you but you need. But, but the question wasn't um, what was happening during the time. The question was why three years three. specifically? Oh. Why, why that specific number? All right, so let's see Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva's argument. All right, so Rabbi Ishmael says three months during the first year and three months during the last year and 12 months during the middle year which makes 18 months. All right, so Rabbi Ishmael says, basically, I'll try a different color. Oops. He says, basically, if you have three months here, and then you have the full 12 months in the middle, that's enough, right? Part of one, full middle, part of, part of three. And then Rabbi Akiva basically says, kinda, but I think that I'm gonna drop my pen. I think, just one month plus the 12 in the middle, right? You don't even need to have more than that. Rabbi Akiva, it would be what we would call more lenient in this particular way of saying that your ownership comes really just because you started a little bit. Rabbi Ishmael wants to have more example of you working the land in year one and in year three. Rabbi Akiva is saying, look, there may be a good reason I didn't work the land for 11 months in year one or 11 months in year three, but if I got a full cycle, a full season out of it, plus a little extra on the other side, then that would be enough for a person who owned the land to have noticed me using it and to then complain, and then for there to be a court case to find out who was the legitimate owner of this. But in this case, should be based on calendar years. Uh, well, agricultural years, well, right? It's more of the, the cycle of harvesting. Cycle of exactly, the cycle of harvesting. Uh, all right, let's do part three, and then we'll, we can come back to questions. Okay. Well, Ishmael said, when does this apply? Uh, with regards to sown field, uh, a sown field, right? Like the ones that you put seeds into. Uh, 
but with trees, uh, but with replantation. If he bought his produce, his produce, 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 produce sorry. If he bought in his produce grapes, collected the olives and gathered his figs, that's the big harvest. This All right, so Rabbi Ishmael here is saying, even if you just worked it for three seasons, but it was different types of seasons. So, you know, you can imagine the piece of land and it has, you know, one, one thing here, it's got figs here and it's got grapes here and it's got olives there. Then even because they ripen at different times, if you bring in your harvest in three different segments, that's also three years worth of harvesting. And therefore it is sufficient because you're, you're using the, the land in three different ways at three different times. Is that Rabbi Ishmael's opinion makes sense? Okay, Aaron, question. I was say, why is Rabbi Akiva considered more lenient? Because it seems like it'd be stricter on the cell of, or on the old owner because he had a lot of time to protest. Okay, so this always, um, what's the right word to put it? Whenever you're lenient in one direction, right. you're being strict in another direction. So it's, it's sometimes just a judgment call of which one you want to emphasize. So in this particular case, he's saying that a person can show possession with less proof. Um, and, and that would be considered lenient because it's the person who is claiming the land you might consider to be the person who normally would have to provide more proof. Because after all, in our regular situation of, of a continually productive piece of property, I would need to produce three years worth of evidence. But in this case, I would only need to produce 14 months. That's a reduction of the larger um, uh, the larger evidenti evidentiary uh, requirement, and therefore it seems more lenient in this case. And since it's also smaller than Rabbi Ishmael's position, it seems more lenient. But you're right. From the point of view of the perhaps true owner, it seems that this is stricter <laughs> because you are limiting the true owner's ability to complain to a much smaller window. And therefore you're saying, hey, use it or lose it. If you didn't notice that anyone was using this for 14 months, I don't care, you're, you've lost your window of protest. It's strict against that person. Yes. And who has the burden of uh, who has the burden of bringing the claim? Well, yeah. <laughs> right. So both claiming theirs. Well, but no, 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 no. So there's one person who's using it, who is in possession of the land, and then there's another person who claims that person shouldn't be using the land. So in this case, the general burden of proof, if these other requirements can't be met, is the person who is saying get off the land. Right. The person who is currently using it seems to have the high ground on, literally, uh, on whether he has ownership of the property. However, if the guy can say, but there's no evidence you were here, you know, in that first year or no evidence that you were here, you know, six months ago, then that knocks the legs out of the claim of this is my property. Uh, I thought he had to, uh, before he could use the time frame to say it's his, right. I thought he first had to say, you know, he either sold it to me or gave it to me, or else he couldn't even make that claim. We're going to we're gonna get there. We're going to get there. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm glad that you were reading ahead, but the idea of what counts as a legitimate claim of ownership is going to come up, but we're not there yet. All right. So the most lenient is the three years without irrigation. Lenient for whom? <laughs> no, for the for someone that wants to challenge the, the ownership. Right. It's a Muslim because it has three years to demonstrate, okay, that uh, that that's my, that's my land. So you mean he has three, if somebody well, shows up in the first month, like let's say I, I take a piece of land, you know, next door, right? We've got a lovely field next door to Temple Israel. So let's imagine that tomorrow um, I go and I build a house there. What do you think Temple Israel is going to do? They're going to call the cops, right? They're going to complain. They're like, there's some guy out there like with a hammer and he's trying to build a house. But that's our property. We have not given it to him. He'll claim that, excuse me, I'll claim, no, no, they did. And they're going to say, what's your proof? Right? Boom, I've got no proof and, and no evidence, even by, by mission of standards, let alone with any title search or something like that. And, and yeah, case closed. I'm, I'm done. Right? I, I lose my hammer. But... As far as it could be two and a half years into the process, and then somebody says, dude, what are you doing on the land? I would still lose that argument if I didn't have any additional evidence to prove that it was my land. Just the fact that I had been on it for two and a half years 
would mean that I, I would have a problem. So yes, if you're talking about the window that is available to the legitimate owner to complain about the squatter, yes, the, the, the continually used field, there is a longer window for complaint. It, again, this is barring any additional evidence. The thing that bothered me with that <laughs> window is the following. Because you want to have sure you have a Ocajol uh, as a car. Ooh, right, right. right. Uh, they are. But you have a claim, right? Yeah, I was expecting that give them less time because force him to do something with the land, that create something, an irrigation system, something. When you say, oh, it's natural, okay, you cut three years, right. it's by rain, it's not. Uh, you don't force the person to really work the land. Right. So we'll get to the improvements and, and, and how that changes yeah. when we get to when you've built on the land or when you've done things to the land. That that comes later in this chapter, um, which I'm beginning to think we're not going to get to tonight. But, that's um, the but the reason why there's also a large window is going to be a little bit made clearer in, in Mishnah 2, because there's another reason why we want to have a large window. Uh, so chapter 3, Mishnah 2. Seven years old, I remember my, we lived in a house in the suburban. Mm -hmm. Because my father bought the land in the in, in the country. In the, right. And um, I remember a discussion between my parents about people is going to invade the land because we were not. You're not going to be there. Building. Right. And so I remember that, that they decide us. We I have we have five girls. Five dollars. And we all went to the land mm -hmm. and start building a, a fence right. around the land because if we had at least a fence, right. they will not allow the people to come and then we don't lose it. But if somebody come and invade and put a little house, right now it's house, very hard to prove. We lose it. Right. They can claim it and yep. we lose it. Exactly. So I remember that as a little girl, my parents is talking about that we have to build a fence. So that's, that's very similar. Like I said, we'll talk about fences a little bit later on, um, but that's very similar to what we have going on here. Um, and I think I maybe mentioned this class once before, uh, but my own family's real estate experience with my mother's um, house and the driveway that I tell you is. Yeah. So. She had, you know, a house that was down here, but there was a very long driveway that went up to the main street. And then there was a house here and there was a house here. And then later on, they surprised us and they built two more houses back here and they needed to, to have driveways off of our driveway. But she owned that property. Right? That, that, this was not like a city street. This was her property. You know, you could actually look up the deed and the, the whole thing. Yeah, it's not a great idea. You can, the real estate man over here is going. You should ask for a toll. Okay, so <laughs> when when these when this man uh, there was a person who used to own this whole piece of property, he came to my mother when she just built the house and said, "You know, my wife and I we want to retire to the back. So can we get an easement? Can we get permission to be able to, you know, have a driveway and just use the driveway to come and go?" Um, to our little retirement house we want to build in the back because we're going to sell the front house and just make something smaller. And my mother, of course, was nice and a sucker. And she said, yes, she didn't charge them a penny. And then they divided the property into three pieces, sold all three pieces and moved out of town. Oh. Right. So the people who purchased the land, not only, not only did they think that they, they would have right to come and go, they also thought they could park on it. And they thought they could dig it up to put their cable lines and that they could, you know, change the everything. And my mother had to come out and she had to argue. And, and I asked her, why do you argue about this every time? So they park on it once. If there's just one, she says, because if I don't argue, then they're going to claim I didn't argue. And if I don't argue about it and they claim I didn't argue, then when the sheriff show up, because sometimes this lady would have a party with like 30 cars, they would it'd be an argument of saying, hey, but she didn't argue yesterday. So I thought this was public property. So yeah, th this was not a fun part of my childhood of, of arguing with the neighbors over who owns this property. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> was the end of the story? The end of the story? Well, eventually, um, eventually my mother moved. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a problem up until she left uh, San Diego because uh, different people would buy it. And when they buy it, the person who was selling it yeah. would not explain yeah. what the rules of the usage were. 
they would actually say, many of the neighbors who moved in would say, but the real estate agent said that this was a public, this, this was a public road. And my mother would say, yeah, they lied. <laughs> it's not a public road. Here's the, the deed, here are the markers here. It's, she's like, I'm paying property taxes on this piece of dirt. Yeah. I get to control what happens to this piece of dirt. <laughs> and the fix and the repairs of this tree. Yep, she had to pay, she did. It was her property. It's like her driveway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was, this was and, and then she would also have problems. Like I said, this, this person here used to have these enormous parties and she would say, look, if one of these people come out of that party drunk and they get hurt on my property, I'm the one who's going to be in trouble for it. So I have to call the cops and get them to move these cars off my property and get them to clear because otherwise I'm I'm not putting, a, it was no fun. You were not very popular there. Huh? There were lots of issues with some of these neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> the people who moved in up front afterwards, they were fine. These people were a eh, little obnoxious, but not too bad. It was the person who lived here that was the biggest problem. But yeah, it was <laughs> not, a, not a happy memory. All right. Mishnah 2. <laughs> now that we've had the flashback, I'll have to go talk to my therapist about it. <laughs> it was a city fault, basically. Absol oh, abs yeah. Yes, thank you. So it was the city's fault for designing the property like this. Yes, yes, yes. And it's now not legal in, in at least San Diego to make property like this because of the problems that it creates. Right? If they're going to make property like this, then this has to become city property. It has to be a county maintained um, strip of land because otherwise it's just gonna cause fights. Uh, so yeah, because, not because of our family, but because they had problems like this all over San Diego, they eventually stopped allowing people to divide property into those shapes. I don't know if it's illegal here, but I have seen several properties like that for some yeah. Where they actually, is, this is owned by one person? Yeah. 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 And you have, it's not an Eastman. Right. This is your property. But what happens if somebody can't get to their property except by yours? Tough luck? Yeah, so there is there is other properties they sell. There's like the third property that you have in the bottom. Yeah. This one, yeah. They, they, they claim there is no access to it. There is no roads to it. Wow. Yeah. All right, Florida. <laughs> Work on getting your laws in order. <laughs> well, how, do you, how do you get there? You know, yeah. Horse? Yeah. <laughs> or, no, you, yeah, hovercraft. Exactly. Just parachute. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I mean, all of these issues that, that were happening in the Mishnah times, and of course, even prior to that, they're still relevant. Yeah. Um, some of the laws are different depending upon Florida, San Diego, or whatever, but the, the basic issues are the issues that come up when you have people living on property. Right? <laughs> this is what people argue about and, and what can cause big problems if you can't resolve it by a shared set of laws. Uh, so thank you, Mishnah. I right. wish we had this better in California. <laughs> There, there are three regions with regards to possession, Judea, beyond the Jordan, and the Galilee. Okay, so um, if you, if you, I'm not going to draw it, but if you picture Israel, right, you have the north of Israel, that's the Galilee. Mm -hmm. You have the middle part of Israel, that's Judea. Yeah. Nobody lived in the Negev, so that wasn't an issue. And then you had across the Jordan, which is in what would be called modern, um, the modern country of Jordan. Interesting, no one was on the, in the coast. Uh, there were some because you go down to like Caesarea and, and, and Yafo and that area, there, there were people that, that would have been considered the Judea section. Remember, Judea was the um, what do you call it? The Roman um, uh, area, the Roman province uh, of Judea, which was not the full state of Israel that we have today. No, no, for that's why I'm surprised that the different areas does not include the coast. No, no, but Judea did include. Part of the coast, the Roman Judea did. I know nowadays when we talk about Judea and Shomron, it doesn't. But they're not talking about the geography hill Judean deserts. They're, they're talking about the area the Romans called Judea. Yeah, the southern coast was included Judea, but not the, the middle of the land. Not the middle of the land. I mean, in between Tel Aviv and Haifa, not. Well, no, Caesarea was, and that's that's halfway to Haifa. What? Caesarea was considered part of Judea. I mean, well, for, under the Roman occupation, yeah. I mean, that the Romans divided up their own districts. But the thing was that people who lived in these different sections, we've mentioned this a couple of times, they often had different customs. They often were where they lived. 
uh, much like you might imagine a modern American state. You know, you're going to have Florida, Alabama, Mississippi. There, there are little states that are much smaller than American states, um, but there were these little zones. Uh, and the problem, of course, is if I live in Jerusalem and I have property uh, up in Iberias, how often am I going to visit my property? Right? That. How am I going to know somebody like, like your family was great? Yeah. We've got property in the middle of nowhere. How are we going to know if someone is trying to take it over from us? So that, that's what this mission is talking about. So we have the divisions. Now, part A. Uh, if the owner was in Judea and another took possession of his property in the Galilee. Or? Or if, or if he was in the Galilee and another took possession of his property in Judea, such possession does not demonstrate ownership until he is in the same region. All right, so you are on, we okay? No, we are checking the map. Ah, the of the Judean map, map. yeah. Yes, and actually ending the coast a little to the, the north of Jaffa. Right. But a little north. Mm -hmm. That's Caesarea is not part of Judea by the- Oh, that was part of the, 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 the Syrian? Galilee. Right. Yeah, the Galilee. Like the Galilee, but not the Judea. Gotcha. So if you live in one section and the guy takes ownership of another sector, takes possession of another section, if you're not there to complain, it, his living there for three years doesn't prove anything. Right? An absent owner, if you're in a completely different zone, not next door, but a different zone, doesn't prove, uh, can't prove that you gave up ownership of this. So yes, if you live in, in Jerusalem and he takes possession in Tiberias and four years later you show up and you can show that you were living in Jerusalem the whole time, he only has one year on the clock. He does not have four years on the clock. He's only got one because you weren't around to cause a ruckus. Make sense? So under Jewish law, your family would not have had to worry if they lived far enough away from the property that, 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 that you needed to build a fence around because if we're not there, that doesn't, the fact that someone took it over doesn't mean anything about our permission. It, it just means we weren't there to complain. Make sense? All right. Uh, part two goes on with Rabbi Yehuda's um, Rabbi, tweak. <laughs> Rabbi Judah said they had a spe a spe specified a period of three years so that if the owner was in, the, in, in Spain and another took possession of his property during one year, they could make it known to the owner during the next year, and he could return in the third year. Okay, so Rabbi Yehuda tries to give an answer for Yerach's question about why three, and Natan had as well. And he says, look, let's imagine we've got our three-year timeline, and I live in Spain, right, which is the other end of the Mediterranean, which is about as far away as you can get in this time period. So... Somebody moves in, a messenger goes to Spain to find me, All right? This is Spain. And he says, hey, <laughs> Rabbi Neely, some guy is building on your property. Did you know that? And I'll say, no, that's not right. And I'll send a messenger back or go myself to come and complain before the third year is up. So Rabbi Ahura says, look, we've already covered long distance owners. Right? Three years is enough time for word to reach the owner, for him to take action and return or send a messenger to protest the, the guy moving in. So therefore, we don't need any special rules about this. Three years is plenty of time. Right. Rabbi Yehuda does not win this argument. No, right. The halakha does not go according to him. Because if nobody come and tell him. Yeah. How do I know someone's going to show up and tell me? Right. I mean, what if nobody wants to send a letter to Spain? <laughs> right. It's it's just it's not reasonable to put the burden on of of, uh, of returning on the owner um, when you live in the other side of the world and you shouldn't lose your property just because you live somewhere else. Make sense? All right. I think. I noticed. <laughs> The point B about what happens if you have a piece of land in, in a Galilee right. or another in Judea and, and you are leaving one of those and someone else go to the second one. Right. So that's what we talked about. 
Yeah, but wasn't clear. That was a discussion. <laughs> so you don't have you lose that the land. No, 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 no. You keep that. If I live in Jerusalem, yes. and my property is in Tiberias, yeah. and and somebody moves into my property in Tiberias, and I'm in Jerusalem this whole time. And four years from now, I go to Tiberias to visit. And I notice this guy's got a house and he's got a field and all of that. And I go to the Beit Din. The Beit Din says, well, you know, he's been there for four years. And I say, yeah, but I've been living in Jerusalem. The Beit Din goes, ah, and as long as I can prove I've been living in Jerusalem and not just making that up because I was lazy, then no, he loses the right to that land. Because, three years. Well, he loses the three years, which means he's only got one year on the clock of legitimate living on the land. And now that I'm objecting, he gets kicked no. off. The squatter. the squatter gets kicked yeah. off. Right? If I'm not around to complain, then his ownership presumption, his chazakah, doesn't start ticking. And now he may think it's ticking, but legally it's not until I am in the same district. Now, if I move um, from, from Jerusalem to Tzfat, Right? And he's building and living in Tiberias, and I'm there for three years, and he's in Tiberias. Well, I'm sorry, you're close enough that you should know what's going on. But it's three years, and by the fourth year, you go to the same. Yeah. He could be there for 10 years, but if I'm living in Spain or living in a different part of uh, the country, oh, it's three years in the, in the same region. I have to be in the region with the land that's being used for three years before he has the chazaka, oh. before he has the presumption of ownership. So it's basically if you're in the area, you essentially have constructive notice of what's going on. What you said in American legalese. Oh. <laughs> Presumption that you'll know what's happening to your property if you're in the region. Uh, if you're not in the region, we cannot assume that, and therefore you're not penalized for not knowing what's going on. So only if you're in the region, you have the three years. Basically. Exactly, exactly. But if you run away, it doesn't matter how many. Exactly. Now, to come back to the question of, well, what happens if it was my father's property and I've been gone 30 years and I inherited it from him and all of that, then yeah, that is eventually going to end up in the court and it's going to be very hard to prove that it was really your father's property because maybe no one's alive that can prove that. It, it then becomes much harder to prove, but still technically, yes, if you can prove you know, to the court's satisfaction that this is your property that came from your father, that you've been away for 30 years and you want it back, Technically, they can kick the people off the property because you weren't around to complain. It'll just be much harder to prove that because you'll have very little evidence at that point. Okay. Um, I think, you know what? I think we can just do mission of three because it actually is pretty straightforward uh, of what's going on here. We have a lot of examples, but the examples, I think, should make it pretty clear what's happening. Sometimes more words actually makes it easier. <laughs> All right. Who's going to be a reader? Okay. An act of persistence without which there is no claim on the ownership of the property is not valid possession to establish ownership. Okay. So we've talked about the squatter, but let's divide the squatter into two different types. You might have the squatter who shows up and puts out the mailbox and tells everybody, this is my address and has a housewarming party and invites the neighbors over and says, Love, lo my lovely new home. All right. That's one kind of squatter. And then you have another kind of squatter, which comes in, builds the house back in the bushes, and doesn't tell anybody that he's there. Those are two very different circumstances. Now, how do we tell one from the other? That's what the, the next part of this mission is about. How is this so? Right. How, what do you mean claim? What, what, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. If he said to him, what are you doing on my property? And the other answered, no one ever said anything to me. This is not valid possession establish ownership okay just it's so funny the way people you know basically have the same kinds of weasel words 2000 years ago that they still try to use right so you show up you find a guy living in your property and you say what are you doing here and he says well no one's ever mentioned anything to me i am not then the clock is not ticking for me to do anything with you right because you didn't actually claim you owned it you, you just you know said oh Oh, okay. Right. You didn't answer. You didn't say yes. You didn't say no. You just blah, 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 blah. So, so, with it, sorry, you understand. so for me to claim ownership after three years, I have to claim ownership. I can't just say, well, no one's objected. I have to tell the rightful owner, 
I think I own this. Or so the that the, or the neighbors. Well, no, really it has to be the rightful owner so that the rightful owner can say back, no, you don't. And then we actually know whether or not there's a rightful owner that's going to contest this. So you need to look for the, uh, for the real owner. You don't need to look for the real owner, but when you confront the real owner, you have to say the right thing. You can't just say, oh, I've been here. You, but what, what, give me the example from the next one of what do you actually say? What's the right thing to say? If he said to him, you sold it to me. You gave it to me as a gift. Your father sold it to me. Your father gave it to me as a gift. This is a valid possession to establish ownership. Okay, so if I claim, what do you mean, what am I doing here? I bought it from you, boom. Now we have a real chance to settle a disagreement. Uh, you're not being weaselly. You're not trying to not say yes and not say no. You've made a statement, and your statement and my statement can go to court. <laughs> and in court, they'll, they'll work out. But if you just say, oh, well, no one objected, get out. Right? These three years don't mean anything if you're not willing to claim that you own it. And you have to actually make a claim. You have to say how it came to be yours. Because you can't just say, I'm living on this land, right? This is not Oklahoma, where you can just take a piece of land from an Indian and not care, right? If you claim to have land, you have to make a claim of how it became your land. You, you, you can't just say, whoa, no one objected when I'm living here. And I thought it was a free piece of land. I right? like, no, this is, this is not America in the 1800s. And I wasn't free then either, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> okay, is that, does that make sort of clear what's going on here? And you have to provide some explanation of how you came into the property and you have to do it in a, a meaningful way. Good. He who holds possessions for three years due to inheritance from the previous owner does not need to make a claim. All right. Meaning to say if it was the previous owner who actually purchased the land or received the land and then his kid on that person, well, the kid doesn't have to make any claim other than just I inherited it. He doesn't have to explain how his dad got the land. He just has to say, I got it from my dad. What happens if the dad stole the land and passed away after a few months and, and okay, the kids are out of the pool? Then we need to go back to the records and to witnesses and try and bring evidence that, in fact, it belonged to someone else. And then it becomes a, a balaga. It becomes a big mess. I thought, if, uh, I thought if the person claiming the land didn't object within the three years, assuming he was in the region. Uh, again, assuming he was in the region and assuming the, the guy was actually making the claim, my father got the land and gave it to me, then yes, if he didn't object, then that would be fine. But if he objects, like when he shows up from Spain, then, you know, we have to work it out. Yeah. And then, it, then it gets a mess. <laughs> All right. But we have another category of people who might be on the property, who might also think they can claim the property. And the, the Mishnah wants to rule them off the list of people who are potential uh, takers of the land. Craftsmen, partners, sharecroppers, and guardians cannot establish ownership through possessions. All right, so let's imagine you hire someone to build you a house, and it takes them three years to build a house because construction workers are slow. And at the end of the three years, they go to the court and they say, well, this is my property, right? I've lived here for three years. Of course, everybody knows I've lived here for three years. Look, I've been building myself a house. No, <laughs> being on the property without the owner objecting, because he hired you for three years, does not entitle you to claim the property, right? Same thing if you are the sharecropper, right? He hired you to work the land and you're gonna work and you'll share part of what you make with him and you'll keep the rest for yourself. You could do that for 20 years. That doesn't mean you own the land. It just means that you're using the land with his permission. And 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 so too as well with, with partners, you know, we were both, um, working together on the land and you've been there for three years and maybe I was somewhere else for three years and we were sharing the profits. That doesn't mean you own that piece of land now. It, it just means that we are partners with it. Uh, and, uh, and and guardians as well, right? Somebody looking after the land on my behalf. I hired you to be a watchman. That doesn't mean I hired you to own my land, even if you were there for three years. Make sense? It's very reasonable, I think. Part A. A man can establish one ownership through possession of his wife's property, nor may a wife establish ownership through possession of a husband's property, nor a father of his son's property, nor a son of his father's property. Right, so a husband happens to be living with a wife on a piece of property that um, 
uh, that she owns, and therefore it becomes his? Or if she dies, she, he can claim that it was his? What about her heirs? Right? What about her, if it was you know, belonging to her family and it wasn't actually going to become his? Just because he was living there doesn't mean that he can now claim it. And so to parent a child, uh, you, you, don't, you don't, just because you're there with permission doesn't mean you now own it, um, even if you were there for three years, because there's another reason why you were on that property, because of the relative. The husband inherits from the wife though, right? There are ways to make it so that a husband can't. Um, but this would be superseding inheritance by saying, I actually own the land because I live on it, right? And I've lived for three years with no one complaining. It's like, well, no, your wife wasn't going to complain that you were living on her property because you were married. <laughs> that doesn't mean you suddenly become the owner. Yeah, you're, you're right. The, the wife might complain if she doesn't like you, but that's a whole other question. <laughs> so the possession of the son to the father, it would be the only to inheritance. Exactly. The, the kid doesn't get to claim his father's land because he lived on it for more than three years. He claims his father's land because he inherited it from her father, which, by the way, also means that while the father is still alive, if the father lets the son work a piece of land for three years, that doesn't mean the son becomes the owner. That, that, that just means the son's using the land with the father's permission, right? And, and vice versa. If the son says, hey, dad, you know, I got a new piece of land up in uh, you know, Tiberias. Uh, well, how about if you work that while I work this? Because uh, I know how good you are with this type of you know, agriculture. That doesn't mean his father now owns it just because he lives there for three years. Do you need to put everything in writing? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's always a good idea. But if your father or son or husband or wife shows up at the baked in and says, I claim this land is my own by the right of being there for three years, and the other person shows up and says, but you're only there because you're my husband, because you're my wife, because my father, because you're my son, mm -hmm. the court's going to say, fine, it's his. It doesn't belong to this person who claims it is there. Right? Your ownership, once you're proven to be that relative, your ownership, your presence does not grant you ownership after three years. So you'd have to have a different way of proving that they gave it to you, that they sold it to you. Or, yeah, it could be a gift. I mean, there's lots of different ways to, to give property to family members, but you're going to have to have proof. You can't just say, I was living there, so it's okay. Uh, all right, part uh, three, I believe. Yes. What is this so that one needs three years to establish ownership? What, like, what, what do we actually, when do we really use this system, right? Part A. Okay. When the person attempts to acquire the land through possession. Right. When you show up and say, it's mine because I've been here for three years. However, part, uh, part when B. When property was given as a gift, <clears throat> or when brothers share a piece of, <clears throat> of their inheritance, or when one claimed title by possession to the property of a convert who, who died without inheritance, then if the claimant has shut in walled up or broken down anything this without inheritors then if the claimant has shut in walled up am I reading the same sentence? <laughs> <laughs> my vision is blurry that's okay it's late <laughs> the broken down anything this counts as securing ownership through possession all right <laughs> so if there is reason to believe that it was given as a gift or that it was an inheritance, uh, not an, uh, yeah, an inheritance from brothers or that it was the property of a convert, which is up for grabs because somebody who converts to Judaism in the ancient world would no longer have contact with their old family because their old family were idol, idol worshipers. And so their, therefore their old family had no claim on the property of a convert. And if the convert had no children of his own or her own, then the land was simply up for grabs when they died. And literally first one, First serve. Um, so that, that, that was uh, an issue in the ancient world. Uh, obviously, if a convert had his own family, then the family would be the ones inherited. Um, I know you're already scheming. You, got, you, you yeah, always have I was, like- a, I was thinking about this good story for at least that. I, I was just <laughs> thinking, you got a mystery novel right there. Yeah. <laughs> but how do you know that it is yours without having to wait three years to prove that it's yours? That's very simple. You go and you do something. Right? You build a fence, you take down a fence. You, you put up a lock, you, you change the, the, the land, you do an act which shows ownership. That act, if you have a reason for doing it other than just you show up, um, will establish that you truly own it 
immediately. You don't have to wait three years for that to kick in. Right? So if I um, uh, will do the property of a convert, it's the, the, the cleanest version here, right? My, my neighbor who was a convert dies, he has no children, he has no wife, he was all alone, he dies, and I go, oh dear, I'm so sad, and I move over, and I put a padlock on his front door, right, with a little note saying, owned by Rabbi Neely now. And then I say, I'm going on a trip to Spain. That's fine. That property became mine the moment I put a lock on it. I don't need to live there for three years before I can claim it's mine. As soon as I put a lock under those circumstances, it is now my property. So what is the minimum that you need to do in order to uh, claim the property? Like, what's the minimum repair? Shut in, walled up, broken down. That's your ownership. Broken down means to work. To if there's a fence down. and you take one of the planks out to get to the property, you own it. That's it. That's it. Because only an owner can do that. I, I know it doesn't seem like much to us, but no. depending upon how you put, try to put a, a minimum um, measure, it could get a little crazy. You have so to be careful with this. That's not applied in America. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, this is this is not American law, nor do I nor do I expect that any claims based on the mission would hold up in an American court. Um, very, very true. But the idea here was that under these circumstances where you had secured the title legitimately, you didn't have to then wait three years to prove your ownership. As long as you actually took possession of the land by making an action that showed ownership, again, under these circumstances, then your ownership was considered to be confirmed immediately. That's what we did in our land. And we that's, have to put something immediately right. to show that we are the owner. Exactly. And so, so that was the, the requirement. Like I said, depending upon the distance, it may have had a different ruling under Jewish law if it was you know, too far away. But mm -hmm. the idea of having a fence, you've, you've closed it in, you've shut it in, you're now clearly um, taking possession of the, uh, of the property. Did you have a question? Oh, it looked like... I thought I saw you struggling with a hand. Just got an itch. Okay. It's it's late. We're tired. Uh, we'll finish there. Uh, a reminder, next week is uh, the holy day before Thanksgiving, uh, era, of, era of Hodu. Uh, so uh, we will not be having class next Wednesday night. And uh, we'll resume the following week. Uh, for next, uh, sorry, tomorrow night. Yes. Tomorrow night we have class. Next Thursday, we don't have class either. And I'll, I'll talk about that tomorrow night as well. Yeah, because next Thursday is Thanksgiving, okay. and so everyone is going to be stuffed with turkey and not come. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, safe journeys. Mm -hmm.